Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan McClory. I'm the general manager for Asia at Portland, which is a public affairs and strategic communications consultancy. And I'm absolutely delighted to be your moderator for this panel session, not least because we have an absolutely phenomenal collection of speakers. Um, so let me just introduce them, starting with uh, Maria Ressa, uh, who is the CEO and executive editor of Rappler Inc. Uh, Gary Liu, the chief executive officer of South China Morning Post. Uh, Ilana Lee, who is the, um, you are the SVP and the managing editor of Asia Pacific at CNN International. And of course, Warren Fernandez, the editor in chief of the Straits Times here in Singapore. Um, and so as the moderator, I think it's incumbent upon me just to set the, the stage very quickly and give us some context. So we're talking about fighting fake news. I think it's worth a quick definition about fake news. Now, I actually find the term fake news deeply unhelpful. Uh, but it's something that has become so ingrained in the public discourse on the issue that we're stuck with it, and we're probably going to have to work with it. But when we talk about fake news, when we think about the cause that it can, or the, the uh, damage it can cause, we're talking about disinformation. And disinformation um, is, according to the, the British Government Communication Service, the deliberate creation and dissemination of false or manipulated information uh, that is intended to deceive for the purpose of causing harm or for political, personal, or financial gain. Um, the other thing I want to say is fake news, it's not new at all. This has been, fake news and deception has been used uh, for you know, financial gain, for political gain, for diplomatic gain since the organization of markets, uh, elections, or um, sovereign territory. Uh, but at the same time, it is new. It's something that we've really only uh, begin to come to terms with. And, uh, so we've got this phenomenal panel of representatives from some extremely credible and, and dif different, diverse media organizations. And one of the things that I kind of want to have the panel address first is we have this, you know, the curious optics of this panel where we're talking about fake news and fighting fake news. And being that all of our speakers are from media, it almost looks like the media is on trial here for giving us fake news. Now, obviously, that's not the case. And so I just want to start the, the conversation off um, with... You know, if we're not, obviously media is not at fault here, but who do we blame for this? What are, what are the sources of this, uh, of this issue? And, and I want to I turn to, uh, to Gary uh, first to, to try and grapple with that. If not media, then who's to blame, Gary? Yeah, thanks for turning to me first. Um, <laughs> I know you really want me to say Facebook, but it's not as easy as a single party, a single collective of people that are at fault. I think there is a, there is a fundamental issue uh, that has created the increased density uh, and, most importantly, the increased impact of dis and misinformation, uh, which is what we're struggling with right now. And that fundamental thing is a changing, the changing economics of media uh, and the democratization of voices because of the Internet. Okay, so let me break both of those two things down. The, the Internet, the democratization of knowledge via the Internet has ostensibly been a very, very good thing. It means that everyone has access to the same information regardless of where you are, your educational background, your ethnic background. Uh, your, your access is generally supposed to be the same. But the shadow side of that is that it has equalized people's voices to the point where there are effectively no gatekeepers. I'm teasing them, you know, setting you up for, the, for a gatekeeper <laughs> later. Um, and, and what that means is that Everyone has a bullhorn, and it has become increasing. It's very, very easy to create content, especially creating content that may look like news. Now, on the other side of it, which is the economics, is that the economics of the internet right now incentivizes people to create content that are at the extremes. Because when content is at the extremes of an opinion, it gets more eyeballs and therefore generates more revenue. So suddenly, we have an economic system and we have the platforms that allow for people to uh, not only be incentivized by, but rewarded by creating things that are so far on the edges of truth uh, that, you know, it, I mean, and platforms have a very, very easy, are a very easy way to disseminate that. So some people do it for the sake of profit. Some people do it accidentally to some degree. And then, of course, you have systems in the middle that are just effectively covering their eyes and saying, listen, we care about shareholder value, so we have no accountability here because we're just the middleman. So that's why we have such an accelerated and egregious issue with fake news today. And as news organizations, we obviously care deeply about it um, and tr are trying very, very hard to, to participate in the, in the solution, in the solution building. 
Yeah, great. Um, Marie, if I can turn to you, could you talk us through what does a disinformation campaign look like? As somebody who, who you know, I mean, the work that you do is trying to flag, uh, you know, malicious disinformation, but you've been a target of disinformation campaigns as well. Talk, what does that look like? Uh, sure. Exponential attacks, uh, an average of 90, 90 hate messages per hour, and it is targeted. So just to like, I completely agree with what Gary said, but in the end, this is about money and power, right? Those two things, money and power, and that this kind of, uh, the, the to blame part is technology. We've seen this movement towards populism much slower pace until about 20, the end of 2015, 2016, and then it popped and the accelerant was really technology. And that's where you can throw in everyone. And, and the biggest culprit really is this online advertisement driven, um, is the business model that essentially subverts choice. And it is really truly a, a threat, not just to journalists, to democracy, to markets, right? This is. It's completely different. It is completely new. It looks the same. You may not feel it. I felt it immediately when we ran a series in 2016 on the propaganda war. Three-part series, I wrote two of the three parts, looking at how we're being manipulated on, at that point, it was on social media. But what does it look like? Visceral, nonstop uh, threats to, you know, from murder, rape, to the way you look, the way you sound. Uh, a doxing effect. Uh, it is extremely personal and it is the phrase that we've used, um, I, we participated in a research project with 12 other groups from around the world and the phrase we came out with was patriotic trolling because where it becomes more dangerous is that the people who have moved to embrace this kind of scorched earth policy is our governments. Patriotic trolling, online state-sponsored hate that is meant <laughs> to control the narrative. So it stifles voices that are perceived to be critical. Um, and in many cases, in the Philippines in particular, we have data that shows that news groups were targeted, specifically targeted with exponential attacks to bring down credibility. Uh, and then I'll say this one last thing. What, what does it look like? It's the same in every part of the world. And democracies have felt this, cheap armies on social media. It's not just about whether it affected the 2016 elections in the United States. It is about subverting facts, right? Replacing facts with lies. Alternative realities, you've heard this before from the White House, for example. Uh, so if you can pound a lie a million times, if you say something a million times, it can replace a fact. If you make people doubt the facts, if you have no facts, then you can't have truth. If you don't have truth, you can't have trust. And if you don't have trust, no truth, you have no democracy. So this is, that's the foundational end of it. But the people really under attack, individual journalists, the news groups themselves, women attacked 10 <clears throat> times more than men. Yeah. Um Elena, uh, I mean, all media organizations have had to come to terms with social media platforms and their growth and the fact that Facebook is now the largest publisher of news. How is an organization like CNN, which is not just a television broadcaster, but a massive multimedia news platform, how are you striking the right balance between making the best possible use of social media, but you know, responding appropriately when you see you know, disinformation, fake uh, news? I mean, that, that's a really big question, but mm. let me just, on the heels of what Gary and what um, uh, Maria has said, I mean, fake news has come into our vernacular quite popularly since the election. You know, if every, every, everyone who approaches me and they know that I'm from CNN, they talk to me about Donald Trump and they want to talk to me about fake news, right? And so I think, number one, we need to define what fake news is. As you mentioned before, fake news isn't, isn't new. We've had yellow journalism. You can call it spin, you can call it a lie. Whatever it is, fake news has existed as part of our, the fabric of our lives for, for a very long time. But here, when we talk about fake news, we've got to really clarify, what do you mean by fake news? When it, comes to, when it comes to the President of the United States, he uses fake news as any news or information he does not agree with. And, and that, the power doesn't like. And the power doesn't like, right? And we see that in many countries. I mean, Maria, Ressa, Maria is a target of that. So that 
to lump all that as fake news is, is wrong. It's inappropriate. There is a world of fake news, but just because it's a disagreement with the powers that be, that should not be automatically in, in, attributed to fake news. So that, setting that stage aside, you know, social media is a very powerful tool for us. You know, we are a multimedia uh, organization, but just even from my personal experience, when the Sichuan earthquake happened, I didn't hear it from a television station. I didn't hear it from a radio station. I heard it from this little company called Twitter. That's how I found out about the Sichuan earthquake back in China. So we understand the power of it. We understand the, the, the immense uh, distribution channel it has. Where we strike a balance, and I think this is what Gary also mentioned, is that for, for platforms such as social media to think that you are a neutral bystander, and you are allowed to just aggregate any kind of information and not have a responsibility. I think that is all, that's at the heart of this, the debate of fake news. And for us, we believe that we, are social, we have a very strong social platform, we have a strong television platform, you know, we have multiple platforms. So we think there is a responsibility as a major <coughs> distributor on the content that we decide to put on our platforms. We cannot hide behind the fact that we're not a new, that we're just a distribution plan. I mean, I think that's a real, that's, that in itself is, is something that, that a lot of people grapple with. Yeah. Can I jump in? Yeah, minute? please do. No, I mean, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, it's, it's about credibility, it's about trust, and ultimately it's about democracy. Just to give you a very real example, since we were trying to define fake news, I mean, last weekend uh, we had a situation where there was a major turnaround in the air quality here. Overnight, suddenly we get the haze intensifying, and Saturday morning I'm out on my run with my bunch of friends, and they look at these, you know, the sky and they say, this is terrible. They look at their phones and um, the numbers are showing the average pollutant standards index doesn't quite tally with what they're seeing. And they see the reports in the mainstream media and they say, why are you guys putting out fake news when the numbers don't tell you what they see? So we get accused of fake news. So very quickly, I got into my newsroom to say, what's going on? Why do the numbers not tell you what people are seeing? And through that process of verifying and trying to identify what was going on, it became clear to us that the average number that was being put out wasn't quite the number that you should be looking at for what was the situation now. And the authorities had put out a more precise indicator, which was the PM2.5, the more tiny particles that you would be ingesting if you were out on a run, you know, taking in all that muck. And that was the accurate number to put out. So very quickly, we put on our website both numbers so that people could have the information. So the point I'm trying to make is fake news is out there, and because people are reacting to it, it's being spread very rapidly. It then becomes incumbent on us, uh, folks who are minded to get information out you know, in a credible uh, responsible way to step up and try to sort of address those concerns that the audiences have. Because if we don't, we will undermine that trust in the public institutions and you will undermine the ability to have an agreement on the basic facts upon which you then can have a discussion about what to do about the, pollutants, the pollution out there or how to, how to deal with it. In the absence of accurate facts, you can't have a discussion and you can't have a democratic debate. It, to, to build on that, is there, to play devil's advocate, is there a potential upside to this concern about fake news? Where do you find it, a, a, I suppose it's a question to all of you, but to, to you, Warren, first, do you find it uh, a motivator yeah. to, to produce a better product and, and be more, uh, give more assurance to, to what you're putting out? Very much so, because I think with so much fake news out there, and it is becoming a problem, more and more of a problem, an audience is saying to us, uh, we need help to figure this out. Uh, they see stuff out there, they get a video. This morning we got a video of, of birds which were falling out of the sky in Indonesia because of the pollution, and people are asking, is this true? Mm -hmm. So we are trying to verify, is this the, a true situation? And if so, we will publish it. So it is both a boon and a bane in the sense that because there's so much fake news, there is a shift towards more credible and trusted voices, and that's where you know, professional newsrooms have a role to play. And if you look at the trust barometer that Edelman puts out every year, we have seen a decline in trust in media as a whole. But if you go deeper into this, the findings, 
there is an increase in trust in professional newsrooms, trusted sources, and that's an opportunity for all of us in the mainstream media to step up and play that role. I would agree yeah. with that. I mean, we, we talk about how uh, Donald Trump is making America great again. He's making journalism great again. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a, there's a, when you walk through the newsrooms of our organizations, you know, there is a, it's an incredible motivating factor. You know, no one goes into journalism to make a lot of money. We came into this business because we had, we wanted to talk about the truth. We wanted to talk about issues that a lot of people were not talking about. We were called a fourth state for a reason. And so it is very, it's very debilitating when you're suddenly called the enemy of the people. It's very debilitating when your news and the, all the checks and balances you go through to put out credible news is lumped into this big vacuum called fake news. So it's been a real motivator. Uh, the, you walk through the newsroom, everyone is, is incredibly motivated to get it right. And also, you know, we also have to be very careful even more just to make sure that the facts that we have and the information that we're going to put out, that it is correct and accurate more than ever. At the end of the day, you know, there's human error involved as well. And we have to put into that consideration. So we really hurt when we make a mistake, you know, and because I think with all the newsrooms here, when you make a mistake, it becomes, people like to use it as an example. And so we're very careful, and when we do make mistakes, we do have to confess, and we have to, to stand up for it. And so, yeah, I think this is a, I know fake news sounds negative and sounds bad, but I think it, this is actually quite inspirational for us, because there is, a, we have a mission, and we feel very proud of it. Yeah, Gary. Although I do agree with what Elena and Warren are saying, I might have to be a little bit of a wet blanket because <laughs> my fear is that this is actually long term going to be a far more significant net negative than any of us want to admit right now. There are many reasons for it. I will submit two. The first reason is that when you look at major news organizations, mainstream news, uh, that trades in truth, yes, we have grown. Uh, by reach, we have grown in some instances by reputation and credibility, but most of that is among a group of people that were already committed to us. Uh, New York Times, as an example, if you look at their overall growth and their subscription growth, that is coming from coastal liberals, and that is their core demographic, and more and more people on the other side of the coin are not believing the New York Times anymore, do not believe the New York Times represents truth and credibility. And the long-term impact of that, I don't think we've parsed yet. And the second thing is that because of the issue, because of the systems that we're mentioning that are in place that allow for the easy creation and easy distribution of misinformation, we are raising yet another generation, possibly more than one, who have no idea what credible news actually looks like. And in general, just blanket, will ignore uh, media and and, and, well, at the very least, I should say, ignore news reporting and preference opinion from voices that they themselves believe, or at the very least, reiterate what they already believe. And again, that generational impact, I wonder if we've actually thought through how big uh, that impact actually long-term is going to be. It, it is so, worrying, and actually, uh, Warren, you talk about the um, Edelman Trust Barometer. The Reuters Institute at University of Oxford does a, an annual study on attitude towards news as well, and they've seen an uptick in avoidance of news, you know, particularly in the U.S. and the U.K. They just don't want to engage. Well, they get it from the late-night shows. You know, I had a whole generation <laughs> of people saying, I get my news from Jon Stewart. Yeah. You know? and well, he so, was very funny. You know, he, I, it's, um, there's a room for it, absolutely. Um, but there is not a replacement mm. for Sorry. organizations, you know, mm. and I think Maria wants to, yeah. Well, no, I, I'm going to take yeah. it even further negative than Gary because, and I'm normally positive, but <laughs> let's, let's like, the reality is that at no other point in time, and I've been a journalist now for more than 30 years, I'm old, um, at no other point in time have we faced a crisis like this. I think this is an existential moment, and this proves at no other time at this that I've lived through that information really is power. The systems that we are fighting, if you think about it like this, right? Uh, two weeks ago, I was able to interview the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Christopher Wiley, right? And, and he made me think a lot. Like he essentially, 
these social media technology platforms came to our countries. They're, they're Silicon Valley, they're decisions made in Silicon Valley. So in a weird way, those decisions then impacted our countries, in, and I'm gonna say the global south, because Singapore doesn't quite fit that. <laughs> that. Um, so they come into our countries, it's a little form of um, digital colonialism. But at the same time, the next wave was more dangerous. They opened, they enabled mass manipulation at scale, and the next generation to come in are companies like Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica then came and said, and this is what Wiley said, he said, they experimented in my country. Why? The Philippines is fourth year running, the top Filipinos spend the most time online and on social media globally. 100% of Filipinos, 100% of those online get their news from Facebook. And so they experimented, and this is Cambridge Analytica and SCL, its parent company, experimented in the Philippines. And when they succeeded in manipulating, they then, the word he used was ported those tactics to the West. And so it's our, what is happening in our democracy in the Philippines, once the freest in Southeast Asia, is these tactics are coming soon to a democracy near you. They're already in the United States because the United States was the target, right? Um, the Mueller report says that. So not to completely depress you, uh, I think journalists are the front lines <laughs> and we have to fight, but businesses, are also in the front lines and you need to make choices that enable truth telling. Because while you can get short gains, um, if you have no fact tellers, truth tellers, you will not have markets that will run. We cannot have election integrity and we won't have democracy the way we know it, right? Um, I think it's an existential moment and, um, and if we don't do anything significant, our next generation will not know democracy. Having said that, of course, democracy in Hong Kong is different from democracy in I'm Singapore. I'm so glad democracy this is vodka and not water. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, not so, to, please push back. So that, well, maybe we will, let me come to Warren. Yeah, I, I'd like to agree and disagree to some extent. I, mean, I agree that it's going to get a lot more difficult to figure out fake from, from, from real because with the new technologies that are coming and you see these deep fake videos, you know, it's going to be difficult to know if something you see of someone saying something is true or otherwise. So it's going to get more difficult in that sense. But I'm also optimistic because if you look at the findings from these various studies that have been done, the younger generation is a lot more skeptical. They've grown up in this environment of fake news and they're, they're a lot more disbelieving. If you look at who has the greatest propensity to share fake news, it tends to be people who, who are older, who grew up in, era, in an era where there was greater trust. So they see something coming to them on their phones, on their WhatsApp, and they think, gosh, I better alert my friends about it, and they, and they share it. And so I think the younger generation is quite different in that sense. Now, the opportunity for us, I think, in the media is to really step up. I mean, we can't do all of this on our own, obviously. The media can't solve this problem. Businesses and governments and society will have to, to, to do its part. But what we can do is really to go out and make the case to audiences about the role that professional newsrooms play. And here, if you allow me, I'd just like to make a quick plug for the World News Day, which um, the World Editors Forum and the World Association of Newspapers is running on September 28th. I've just become president of the World Editors Forum, and this is something I think is important to get newsrooms out there to show the role we play in exposing corruption, in encountering fake news, in, in uplifting societies. So we've managed to get 30 newsrooms all around the world to sign up, and we're going to try to showcase and celebrate the work that newsrooms do in this regard. And I think the more we can get people to see the value that, you, that, that newsrooms bring and the critical role we play in upholding trust, in building credibility, and in, in the process helping to secure democracies, the more we will help to take things forward. So when people start talking about potential solutions to disinformation, fake news, um, the thing that comes up the most is media literacy, that that's going to be the key which sounds intelligent and all well and good, but it also is quite a ways down the road. Is it going to be enough? And, and Maria, I see you shaking your head. Um, given you are so pessimistic, and <laughs> you talk about the Philippines being a Petri dish, 
um, for, for what we've seen in, in the UK, in the US, in, in 2016 and elsewhere. I mean, is there anything in the Philippines that gives you hope that it might be a petri dish for solutions, having first been the petri dish for the problems? I love the question. Yes, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be fighting, right? <laughs> Good. <laughs> you gotta have hope, but, but again, it, it isn't, the problems are global, so these global decisions have affected local. That's where they affect the Philippines. The solution is not local, the solution is global. Right, so one of, the, one of the ways that we're looking at it is uh, I'm part of the Information and Democracy Commission. It was set up by RSF. Uh, it's headed by Christophe Deloire and uh, Nobel laureate Chirin Abadi. 25 people, 18 different countries from tech, from media, from the academe, from civil society. And the first thing we did two years ago was to come up with a set of principles. What principles govern the internet? We have standards and ethics. We, each of our organ, not as individuals alone, but our news <laughs> organizations have standards and ethics manuals. Um, and we are legally liable for anything that is published on our platform. But the internet, those tech people that Gary is part oh, of. Gosh. <laughs> You're they, the tech guy, what, Gary. What actually <laughs> governs you, right? And so, so the, idea, the idea really was like, how can we, to think about this world as something like post-Holocaust, post-World War II, when the world had to come together to prevent people, from, to prevent humanity from destroying, from carrying out the atom bomb. From, and so what did they come up with? Bretton Woods, NATO, uh, the UN Convention of Human Rights, right? All of these things happened after the world came together. I know you're sitting there and you're thinking, maybe she's too alarmist, it's because she's under attack. Did I mention I, I have at least 11 cases and investigations filed against me and Rappler? Uh, I've posted bail eight times in three months and been arrested twice in five weeks. I'm not a criminal, by the way. I'm a journalist. <laughs> um, the reason why I think this is so important right now is because that the model of the model that gets your attention plays to the worst of human nature. You as an advertiser in the tech platforms actually are paying for radicalization further down the line, right? So the way you're kept on, it, it essentially saps human will. You please challenge me on this because I'm still grappling with these ideas. And so in many ways, media, we used to be both the distributor of news and the gatekeepers when I was with CNN. Great power. But now we're neither. We're not the world's largest distributor of news. That's gone to the social media tech platforms. And we can no longer be the gatekeeper because we don't distribute the news to you. So while we can have standards and ethics, the majority of Americans get their news, not from us. But so, in, But interestingly, I do find when we look at the pattern of news on a day cycle, People get their news, they may not get it from, from us. They'll get it from social media. But when they want the stamp of whether this is really truly news or not, they will turn to credible organizations. And I'm not just saying that because I'm sitting in one. That is the pattern we're seeing. Our demographic and our viewership has not gone, our, our demographic is not increasing to the older areas. No disrespect to the senior citizens, but our demographic has actually gone down over the course of the last couple of years, especially during this uh, very exciting time of the, the US election. So there's a lot of pain. There is a crisis at hand. And I don't, you know, I'm not an optimist to the point of not recognizing it. And I tell you that with a full understanding that it is actually really dangerous to be in this profession. You know, Maria will attest to that. But in the old days, we used to have rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. Like I knew, for example, if I sent a reporter into <laughs> Afghanistan, I knew exactly just what kind of a security system we needed to have for that reported into Afghanistan. Now we've got to think about security in downtown New York where pipe bombs are sent to us. We've got to think about security in DC. We've got to think of security in these different areas that we never had to actually think about. Mm. So <clears throat> we're coming from a point of, it looks incredibly pessimistic, but I'm actually, this crisis, there will be solutions to it. And I do see, I do see hope in, in many areas. Some of it has to come from governments. I think in many ways, some of the social media platforms that you have, they're, they're great influencers. But would they have moved to the level they would have moved if they did not have government regulation breathing down their neck? Would they, 
with the taxes that are being imposed upon them? Maybe not. I don't think that's necessarily bad, but I think there's some good coming from it. So I'm a proponent that I'd rather have a freedom of where my news can be disseminated. I'd rather have these platforms exist, but the rules have to change a bit. And we have to be really quite honest with ourselves what the definition is, who's responsible, and what your responsibility is. Yeah. And so I think there will be a solution in this process, but in the, in the meantime, it's, um, it, it's, they are dark days. Absolutely. <laughs> can, I, yes. can I just add to something? Please. I think it's a bit of fake news to say <coughs> that the younger generation aren't reading the news. Completely. That, that's put out there as though it's fact. But I look at the website numbers that we have. It's a much younger audience than our print audience. And it's a growing audience. So I think if we, if we write about issues that young people care about, when we put out stories or videos or, or graphics about the environment and climate change, huge audience from the young crowd. So I don't think it's true, and it's bandied about as though it's fact, that young people don't read news. I think that's completely fake news. Yeah, I agree, completely. So as we, as we um, think about solutions, um, it's obviously, as you say, Maria, and this is going to be something that is an undertaking that will be multilateral, and it will cut across different sectors, public sector, civil society, um, businesses. Um, and the only way you make reference to the, you know, the Holocaust and, and World War II, that, which is like the largest collective suffering humanity has ever known, World War II, have we suffered enough yet under disinformation to bring about the, 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 that huge undertaking of, of, uh, of bringing about a, a multilateral solution to this? Do we need to suffer more? So I hope not. I hope that we can see what's coming up ahead. But I, I, I'll go back and at the risk of flogging a, a horse. Um, <laughs> Data at the micro-personal level gives technology and the companies that control them tremendous power, right? It is, um, and I'm, I'm not the first person to say this. I, Christopher Wiley said it, that Cambridge Analytica whistleblower. You can see he left a mark on me. Um, <laughs> and then uh, a, a tech guy, Roger Balsillie, he is one of the co-founders of, um, of BlackBerry. They called data that it, data is not the new oil. Data is plutonium. Because think about it like this again. If the data that we put publicly on these spaces tells more about us than we know ourselves, can be put together by AI in a way that can manipulate us in ways we do not know, it's extremely insidious. And it is for sale. And it is also manipulated by power. We haven't spoken about geopolitical power plays. Obviously, the tactic of disinformation comes from the Russian disinformation. It is part of the military doctrine. Uh, it is to pound the fracture lines of society, not just for one goal, for to get a candidate elected or not elected. It is to make you distrust institutions. So that if you don't trust institutions, then the voice with the loudest megaphone, whoever has power, gets more power, right? That's the end goal. So let's talk about Russian. Uh, our ro the role, at least in our country, Russia kind of does a B to C, the consumers. China, the other geopolitical power, does a B to B for now, but moving quickly to B to C. Look at what the New York Times today published Twitter released a whole bunch of data, and the New York Times published how, the, um, how Twitter was used for Chinese disinformation. And it isn't, while propaganda has been around for a long time, this exponential pounding of lies is brand new. We, have, we as people have no defenses against it. All right, that sounds really nasty. Let's talk ab about the good thing. Um, Governments are coming on board. And yes, we do need governments. Uh, there's a 14-nation coalition that has had hearings, very sophisticated hearings. It's led by Canada. Britain is the deputy of it. They're looking, members of parliament are looking at, uh, at how to find solutions. A great book to read as you're dealing with this is Shoshana Zuboff. She wrote a book called Surveillance Capitalism. Mm. Um, Come up with something positive again. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, 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 you ended on the word capitalism, which <laughs> I mean, how do we talk positively about capitalism? Right now. 
Listen, like, I, I, I do want to, since we're in a room yeah. of capitalists, yeah. please. This is, this is meant <laughs> to be a You have a lot of power. <laughs> Let me, um, I, I don't think we've suffered enough. I don't think that oh. there is actually, I'm sorry. Sorry, Maria. I don't think that there is I've going suffered. to be a switch yet. And I think the, one of the main reasons, not the only one, but one of the main reasons there is not going to be a massive, fundamental, uh, global shift in this situation yet is because the markets have not been hurt by it. And the reality is that, um, that you know, first of all, the capitalists in this room have access to direct and honest information 99% of the time. You guys are trading off of real information. You, you're lucky enough to have the systems of access uh, and, and really the, the, the taught intelligence to, 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 have, to, uh, to know truth from uh, falsehood. The rest of the world, generally speaking, the, the vast majority of the world's population does not have that level of understanding and education. Um, if, you were, if you had to trade not off of the Bloomberg terminal but off of Facebook, I think this thing would be fixed pretty quickly. <laughs> Uh, honestly, and the reality is that Trump tweeting lies uh, and other world leaders, not just Donald Trump, Absolutely. right? There are many world leaders doing the same thing. Uh, that causes instability in the markets, that causes uh, unpredictability, and today unpredictability is great for capitalists. Mm. It's great because the smart people in this room are making money off of that unpredictability. And so right now, I think that the, the, the issue of fake news, yes, it's impacting democracy, Yes, it's impacting uh, the progress of civil society around the world, but it's, it has not yet dramatically had a negative impact on markets. And I think it's not the only reason why it hasn't shifted, but I think the moment it does, and that might be nuclear winter time, but the moment it does, I think then things will start to dramatically shift. If you guys start pricing in the impact, the social impact of fake news into what you do, just the same way as capitalists are starting to price in climate crisis into what they do, right. that's when change, I think, will happen from the people in this room. That was a little bit of a soapbox moment. I hope you guys don't mind. No, Gary, that was great, because I think that's the first new solution we've got. We've got to shut down the Bloomberg terminals. And if we can do that. <laughs> Bloomberg, I like that. Yeah, we'll, 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 if, if you trade for one day off of Facebook, woo, that's going to be a fun experiment. But, I do, no, but, I do but you, know where, you is, know where it fits, though, is that your audiences, your consumers, live in our world. And that's where the disconnect will happen. And, mm. and part of this is we're seeing a geopolitical power shift. Everything is being turned upside down. So the tech turned businesses upside down before. And sure, news is now, news organizations have now been, um, what's the word that we? Disrupted. Yes. So we've been, dis every, every, you know, when, when verticals are disrupted, it's OK. But now it's the entire system of governance. Old power has, and you are old power because you don't have to vie for asymmetrical warfare, which is kind of what social media is. Right? But new power, new power, and I'm, I work very closely with Facebook. We're good frenemies because I really think the solution will come from them first because I, while I like you guys, I don't think you'll move fast enough. Um, it is to their enlightened self-interest to fix the problem, and it isn't media literacy. No. The problem is in how we are being manipulated. And we are holding the line for facts. And I think businesses, right now in most of our countries, you're putting your advertising dollars. 85% in almost all of our countries are going to the, the technology platforms. That means news groups are making do with far less. And yet, no time that I can remember um, have we ever had to sacrifice so much to be able to bring you the facts? Mm. But truth is profitable, I would say. You know, I know that there is a, you know, I mean, I, mean, I, I live in that kind of organization where actually we trade on credibility and we do make a profit. We're not an organization where we've got some, you know, very rich kingdom, you know, funneling us and giving us, un, you know, a huge bank account. We have to actually count for every single cent, every single dollar that we spend on what we do. So I would say truth has a currency and it's a profitable currency, but I agree with Gary because I get really quite philosophical when you say, have we seen the worst or not? And sometimes, in, in some sense, I feel like we haven't because a lot of this is being, it's entertainment to a lot of folks, you know? And look at what the discourse has been over the past couple of years. It's entertainment in many ways. And that's when people have that kind of an attitude, I don't, I'm not sure if it's 
we've seen the worst of it. It does pain me when I see, you know, we have to cover stories where, you know, people, there's been someone who's been, you know, pretty much lynched because of false information on the website in India or in Afghanistan. I mean, you know, there is a price to pay, but for some reason in the course of the last couple of years, lies being lost has not been enough to change this discourse or change, you know, change the dynamics. And I think Gary is right. Unless there is actual economics at stake, and people re realize that fake news is not profitable. Unfortunately, it is in many ways, with a lot of people. It's a new industry. It's very, right it's, now. It's very <laughs> profitable. Yeah. But until we get to that point, I don't think it will shift. And I, don't, I don't think it will change. That means our work is twice as hard. Forget twice, it's 20 times harder. Mm. It's funny because profitability is kind of how this first came into public consciousness, right? It was the run-up to the 2016 election and it was those clickbait farms out of, you know, Macedonia run by yeah. teenagers who were, who were just trying were to make a buck off the election. There were 140 basically websites built out of this little town of Macedonia when we, when we traced back, right? It's just incredible, but it was incredibly profitable. So, yeah, I think until, unless people start paying from, starts feeling the pain in their pockets, mm. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not going to it's not going to shift dramatically. Yeah. I, I agree. Truth truth is uh, currency, as you say, but truth is also extremely costly. To run professional newsrooms with fact checking and verification is a very very expensive proposition. I've just come back from India this morning, where we are, we were having a session like this for the Indian editors, and they are incredibly despondent. No no optimism there because they are seeing the trends that we have all seen in the past, where to try to build a business model for paid journalism with paywalls and, and subscriptions is such an uphill task for them because they, all the money on the, on the internet is going to Facebook and Google. They don't charge anything online. They charge a pittance for their print product. So the future looks incredibly difficult for them. Many of us have moved beyond that and we are starting to build subscriptions uh, as revenues online. Uh, I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that our digital subscriptions revenue is now almost on par with our digital advertising revenue. And if we can convince people that there is value in credible journalism, then there is a way forward. It's not easy, but there is a way forward. So that's the real challenge for us. How do we build this business model? I'm a little bit uh, with Gary on, on the pessimism because I don't think the markets are shifting quickly enough and we may have to go through a situation where, I mean, just take, for example, the debate that's going on in the US about when you get the Democrats saying, you know, you should break up these tech platforms. I don't think it gets traction because if we're honest with ourselves, the convenience and the cost-free nature of all this information and, and social platforms is something quite attractive. So to get people to give that up, you've got to show them why they should give that up, and that's hard sell. So I want to kind of deep dive to the country level, because some countries are doing good work around this, particularly those that are susceptible to Russian disinformation, Scandinavia, Finland, probably um, one of the best. You, you, well, Ukraine, they're not quite as well organized as Finland, but they're certainly trying. Um, Singapore, though, is probably the only country in the region that has really thought hard about this and tried to address it. And how, how would you assess the, the approach that the government has taken so far? Well, I think they're trying to do their best to address it because We've, dis we've debated it for about a year, and they've come up with the law. When we went to the select committee to discuss it, we said we were concerned about the impact it would have on legitimate debate and discussion. So in response to that, they set quite a high bar. It, it has to be something which is deliberately false, which is um, uh, clearly uh, against the public interest, and then you could cross that bar. So I think the bar has been set sufficiently high that is unlikely to impact what we do because we are not in the business of putting out deliberately false Correct. news. Right. <laughs> so I'm not too worried ab about that. We also ask for transparency and, and a, a level playing field for mainstream media and everybody else because if you were going to take something down, it should apply to everybody because otherwise, if we are told to take something down and others aren't, it affects our credibility and that's been, that's been agreed to. Uh, so on the whole, I think this is a, is, is, uh, is a serious attempt to try to deal with these issues of fake news, especially with the deliberate pounding of you know, fact uh, and misinformation to turn that into fact, which can come cross-border. So I do think that they, they are trying to deal with it. We did ask, for example, uh, that they also have a, a neutral independent authority which would assess what is fact and what is not. 
they, the, the final legis uh, legislation that was passed didn't take that up because I think the, the authorities felt that they needed to be able to respond quickly and take things down if it was deliberately uh, trying to, to mislead the public. And then you could go and appeal. So there was some disagreement on that, but let's see how it plays out. On the whole, I don't think it's going to constrain the, our ability to operate in professional newsrooms uh, because, as I say, our, our role is to try to get credible, reliable facts out rather mm -hmm. than being in the business of fake news. Yeah. Do you think it will be a model for the rest of the region? Or I don't beyond? know. I don't know. That's hard to say because each country is different. And we haven't sort of seen it in practice. So let's see how it works out in practice first. Okay. Maria, would you want it to be? So ultimately, because the, the platforms are global, so this is a good thing, originally, right? Uh, in 2012, 2013, <laughs> we all believed that days. this would be much more of an enabling environment. And that was when we set up Rappler. I thought we could help build institutions bottom up. We worked with government. We had a civic engagement arm. But the reality also is that this one globe, this global platforms that we have cut across so many different cultures and so many different definitions of what democracy or governance means, right? So what will work in Singapore will not work in the United States, will not work in China for sure, <laughs> um, will not, may not work in the Philippines. So this is the challenge when you have one platform and what these platforms will always tell you is that we want a solution to scale. That is the global challenge. We are all somehow going to have to come up with a solution that scales. And a good example, a most recent one, where everybody actually came in and relatively strong measures were taken quickly was Christchurch, the mm. New Zealand, right? Mm. And, and you had a female prime minister take strong action. Um, the, the platforms took a little bit of time, but, um, but it was actually, there, there were very, what would the West would call draconian measures they wanted, New Zealand wanted every single part of the manifesto and the name of the guy taken down, which an American audience may not want, right? But if you look at it, this is where you bring the debate of national security to the public, because never before could you reach the public without having news organizations as intermediaries. Before, Someone in government would call up the head of news and then they would have to tell us why this is a matter of national security and why we shouldn't be running it. Now it is in the public sphere. I think this has to be a global debate. And the more we write about it and think about it, the better the decision will be. Yeah, Gary. There, there are two realizations, one of which uh, that are not, that are disconnected, but are, are really, really important in this discussion. One of which you just mentioned which is that these systems of information dissemination and distribution are built in a specific country right. under a specific set of ideals and even in cooperation now because Facebook and Google are getting much, much better at playing the PR game and making sure that people know when they meet with the, uh, the heads of uh, news industry or uh, news, news organizations. But even in that cooperation, those news organizations, when they roll out the logo board of the news organizations they've co-created with, they're American. They're American. <laughs> and, the, and the reality is that the solutions they come up with, a solution that is built for the New York Times, that serves the New York Times, will generally not serve the rest, much, much of, certainly this region of the world. And that's, the, that's a huge problem. And I do think that these technology platforms are starting to understand that. But the behavior and the creation process still hasn't changed. The, uh, the justification has always been because tech companies want to launch and iterate, right? That's what we always say. Uh, so we want to launch and iterate, launch and iterate. So the idea is that we want to test something in a marketplace, and the US marketplace is almost the f always the first place that you go to. No, but they right. test it in our countries, remember? The, right, you're the, the petri that's dish. The, that's the bad stuff. I'm, right. I'm the good right. stuff no, they I'm, test yeah. in, the, <laughs> exactly. in the United States, right? Yeah. Um, and, then they, and then they export. But by the time they're ready to export, it's effectively carved in, in stone. Mm -hmm. And we are going back to try and change a system that has already been set. And that's much, much harder mm -hmm. than being part of the conversation when it, is, when, it is, you know, when it is still fledgling, right? So that's one realization we have to come to and really address and change. The other thing I feel compelled to say is that the, the four of us have been sitting here blaming a lot of other parties. And we still haven't really looked inward. Because the news organizations, traditional news organizations, cannot be absolved of responsibility here. 
The reality is that for a long time, we did not take very seriously the significant shift in consumer behavior and the decision-making process that consumers now go through for the sake of discovery and consumption of content. And we thought sitting on our golden goose, geese, golden eggs, whatever it is, uh, in, our, in our businesses that for decades had run exactly the same way that were printing money because we were, generally speaking, monopolistic businesses in our home regions or hometowns, um, that we didn't have to change much. And where we landed, where we ended up, is that the user experience, the discovery experience, the consumption experience, our relationship with our user, our reader, was far inferior to what they were getting from every other source of information. So they were going to gravitate for the sake of enjoyment, for the sake of ease, for the sake of discovery, to other sources. Um, I think that we, we don't spend enough time. And thank goodness, news organizations are now aggressively correcting that. And there's some incredible news organizations, including my three peers up here, that have done awesome work over the last few years to change that user behavior and relationship. But we can't forget that we definitely played a role, even if it is, if the, if the role we played was abdication of responsibility, we played a role that led to where we are today. You mean but, abdication to the platforms or the technology? I, I think abdication in our relationship with our users, which allowed them to shift from one-on-one -on -one relationship with us to relationship with platforms because those were easier to use. But I'm saying that was never possible because the way the platforms did the micro-targeting, not of even all of these things. So, sorry, I'm not saying you're wrong, right? I, what I am saying, though, is I, I think regardless of what we did, no matter how good or how bad we are, we would still be in the same place today mm. because of the way the technology works. I'm sorry. No, I think there's, <laughs> there's, there's two points. I think there are... You know, at the end of the day, disruption is good. You know, I mean, if you if you hark Agreed. back to like, you know, for, how old are we? We're like, like CNN, we're like 40, 40 years now, you know? We were the first disruptor because we had to stick, sit in front of our television at 6 p.m. every day in order to get the news in the United States. Other than that, you missed it. You didn't get the news of the day, right? So we kind of, cable news came about and we disrupted it. Have we been disrupted by the big platforms like the Facebooks of the world? Absolutely. Is that necessarily bad? I don't agree. I don't think it's necessarily bad. But the rules of engagement have to change. The responsibility, what am I responsible for? That we do need to have an honest discussion with that. In terms of your question about you know, what works for Singapore, does it work for everywhere else? I'm a bit of a realist. Hmm. You know, I travel too much to think what works here works somewhere else. That's the whole heart of the conversation about thinking that you can export democracy in the United States form and think that works elsewhere. It absolutely does not work. You know, just to put it into um, to just context, you know, we sent a team into North Korea a couple last year or so and you know one of the we went into the home of one North Korean who they religiously read their newspaper. I mean Gary you'd be happy. They religiously you know read Wait, the am newspaper. I North Korean newspaper? <laughs> I'm a technology yeah. platform. I'm not a North Korean so they are yeah. dedicated and they're reading the Rodong Shimun and then uh, we asked them about fake news. Said, yeah America you've got fake news. We don't have fake news in North Korea. So you know we're very lucky it's you know that's not the solution sure. And so when you're up against that you're just you know where do you be begin the conversation, you know? So yeah. that's just an anecdote that, you know, you know, information is, is vitally important. It's as, as more important than the price of oil, as you've seen this week. Um, and we gotta get it right. And Jet Gary's right. We also have a big responsibility. We need to look into ourselves and make sure that we're doing this correctly. Yeah, I tried to protect you guys early on, but you're right, it shouldn't absolve you entirely. Um, no, okay, no I think, ever. so we've got Heart five track. minutes left, and one of the brilliant things about the, these Milken summits is that the audience is always very intelligent. So I'd really like to go to the floor if everybody's all right with that. We'll take, let's take three questions. Oh God, I, I shouldn't have pissed off the capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're gonna to have to answer for that now, Gary. Um, so I think there are microphones somewhere on the floor, but if you could uh, raise your hand if anybody has a question. So we have one right here, we'll take three at a time, and if you could just give your name, your organization, and please keep your question to a question in very brief as we're running. Uh, my name is Patrick Liu, uh, Gex Ventures. Uh, I agree with uh, some of the speakers here. I think the crux of the issue is not just fighting fake news, it's actually strengthening your credibility, improving your trust level, as well as democratizing knowledge so that all of us can make better informed decisions. I want to address another issue that's a close cousin to uh, fake news, and that's the balanced perspective of news. i give you an example. I've been Anisha, can you get to your question? Sorry, we were running My question really is very simply this. I look at the, looking at the protests in Hong Kong, you know, you look at what the Western media reports, what the Asian media reports, what 
your newspaper reports, it's like taking a totally different perspective. One is focusing on the problems with the authority, the police. The other one is on all the, uh, the dark side or the good side of the protesters. When, how do we ensure that, you know, like you say, professional newsroom give us balanced news so that we can make the better informed decision? Okay, so how are you working on balanced news? Let's go one more. Can we, any, can any we address questions? that first before we keep on going? Do you want to? Just yeah, so sure, we fine. We'll, we'll have to do I'll, it very quickly. I'll take that because, um, like Gary and I, we live it every single day. And it's been physically exhausting, you know, number one for the last, you know, now we're going into our 16th week, is it? And I'll tell you what's exhausting. It's just not the physical, sheer physicality about having the teams on standby going on the field. We have teams in the newsroom that have got to monitor everything that we put out. And I agree with you on that because I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, it's not only about, fake news is not only about the news that you decide to, to disseminate. It's the omission of certain facts. Mm -hmm. And that's also an equally important responsibility. And context. And context. That's exactly to the point. So for example, we've got this thing called a lower third when you watch television. Right? We've got a lower third, what we call fonts. It's like basically Twitter before it was Twitter, because you're limited in the amount of uh, letters you can put underneath that. So for us, it's really important that we don't only say, police have fired tear gas. We have to be responsible to say, police fired tear gas, protesters have thrown petrol bombs. Without one emission, it completely changes the context of what's happening, right? Mm. So, you know, I agree with what you say, uh, and it, it is a real, that, that in itself takes so much sheer manpower to make sure we're doing it correctly. And I can tell you as well, reach, because we're global, it gets harder when, when you're dealing with, when we're, when we're awake in Hong Kong, we're much more attuned to things because we live there. And then you start moving around while we're asleep and other regions pick up. They have it from their perspective. So you wake up to these things that, oh my gosh, how did that font go out in, on air? Or how did that digital headline go out? So you know, you know, I completely agree with you. It's a context and it's the balancing and it, we have a responsibility. 100% agree. It comes down to strength of conviction. Um, our news organization has suffered economically, financially, quite a lot over the course of the last few months. Not only because advertising dollars generally leave when there's bad news, but there have been many advertisers that have pulled out because of ideology on both sides of the issue. We are not going to change the balance of our news organization because of, of money. Uh, and my job is to protect my newsroom for, that, for those editors, to be able to make the decisions that Elena is talking about, be able to, to, to make sure that there is comprehensive fact and a plurality of views on the opinion side of the issue. Uh, and not have to be affected by, the, by outside forces, including economics. That's not an easy thing for, for news organizations to do, but it's Warren, conviction. Warren, you want to come in? Just, just specifically on the issue of Hong Kong, I think the way we try to get balance and context and objectivity is being open to multiple sources. So we take content from the American news agencies, from the Asian news agencies, from the Chinese news agencies, and then we make judgments. And the critical thing for us is, not, is to stay neutral and stay out of the picture, because we're not the story. The story is what's going on on the streets and why it's going on in the streets and helping people make sense of that. So if you, if you keep that constantly in mind, we can try and do a better job at, at reflecting that range of, it's not black and white. There's a whole spectrum of gray in between, and we need to reflect all those range of views. So we're running out of time. Maria, can I give you the last word? Uh. Before it is close. an extremely complicated world today. Even the phrase balanced views, balanced news, neutral. In the age of social media, these things are adapted to in the eyes of the beholder. So what we can do as news groups is to assure you of the standards and ethics that we each have. Each news group has it, they're listed. Um, and oftentimes, I guess, the last thing I would just say is please look at your own biases, at what you want to happen and how the news you consume reflects your own cognitive biases and takes you further away. I think more than at any other time, we need to bring the public sphere together. We have to find what we have in common versus what tears us apart because that is what disinformation and fake news is actually trying to do, tear societies apart. So please, uh, we need to take significant action. We'll keep doing our jobs. Please. We know you will, we know you will. I'm not even gonna try and sum up on that. We've already run over. I think that's a brilliant note to, uh, to end on. Please join me in thanking our fantastic panel for sharing their thoughts today.
That was awesome. Amazing. Thank you.